This is The Black Print, where being black is always the topic of conversation. The Black Print is brought to you by Rhymes and Designs and Good Evil Art. Welcome back to The Black Print. It's MJ. So we're going to be getting into part two of our discussion on black on black crime. So with Ronald Reagan being tough on drugs, of course, mass incarceration. The number of people behind bars for nonviolent drug law offenses increased from 50,000 in 1980 to over 400,000 by 1997. Of course, most of those people were black. It's very interesting when you read the history of the war on drugs and the criminalization of heroin and crack cocaine and marijuana. And then you look at how the government is dealing with heroin now and how the white people are dropping all over the place, overdosing on heroin. Everyone wants to talk about empathy and sympathy and talking about rehabilitation programs and like these actual effective drug education programs and yada, 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 because apparently white people overdosing on heroin left and right is not a governmental plan. So there's these real solutions to maybe counteract the problem but there's certainly not the push to criminalize white people for their substance abuse issues like black people were criminalized even though when other people have substance abuse issues it's called a disease but when it's a black person they're criminals now with the number of people incarcerated based on non-violent drug law offenses jumping from 50,000 to 400,000. Now there's a problem of who are the people that are being incarcerated? These are people's fathers, brothers, uncles, mostly. But these are people that add to the community. These are people that take care of their families. And now you have less and less of these people around. And then, you know, once they get out of prison, what do you do with someone who has a felony? Where do they live? A felon can't live with you and you get government assistance then you have to turn this person away because your kids aren't going to starve because their dad, uncle, brother went to prison. And then there are the guns. This is one of the things that just blows my mind when I see some of these cases or I hear some of these stories or I see some of these videos. And it's like, where are people getting these guns from? These people have military grade or about military grade weapons somewhere in the hood the projects the ghetto where are these guns coming from just like drugs were flooding our communities arms are also flooding our communities one of the scenes that i like from straight out of compton was when they were at the press conference and they started talking about a very similar thing like y'all just got a snapshot of how americans really feel we gave the people a voice We gave the people truth. Yeah, but your songs, they glamorize the lifestyle of gangs, guns, drugs. Our art is a reflection of our reality. What you see when you go outside your door? I know what I see. And it ain't glamorous. You get AKs from Russia and cocaine from Colombia. It ain't none of us got a passport, so... (laughs) Might want to check the source. So, late 70s, early 80s, The government started pumping drugs into black communities. Cocaine was coming in by the truckloads, by the boatloads, and then from there, crack cocaine. When you look at the sentencing laws for crack and cocaine, even though from a pharmacological point of view, they're basically the same drug. It's like a hundred times more severe if you do crack as opposed to cocaine because black people were doing crack cocaine while white people were doing cocaine, even though it was a large population of white people doing crack. But first of all, they would have to be discovered, brought in, and convicted, which, you know, if they're not over-policing your community, there's a much lower chance that that was going to happen. So, you know, government is pumping all of these drugs into our communities. If you've seen the movie Kill the Messenger, it came out in 2014. It talks about this, and the movie is about this journalist whose name is Gary Webb, and he happens upon a story that not only leads to the origins of America's crack epidemic, but also alleges that the CIA was well aware of the dealers who were smuggling cocaine to the U.S. using the profits to arm Nicaraguan rebels. 
Despite warnings to halt his investigation, Webb kept digging and uncovered a conspiracy with explosive implications. As a result of his findings, Webb's career, family, and life came under threat. After publishing the information in the 90s, in the mid-90s, Webb allegedly committed suicide and it was labeled by multiple gunshots. But some of the major claims that he made when he uncovered this information was that for the better part of a decade, a San Francisco Bay Area drug ring sold tons of cocaine to the Crips and Bloods street gangs of Los Angeles and funneled millions in drug profits to a Latin American guerrilla army run by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. And so the movie talks about that a lot. So you have drugs being pumped into our communities by the ton, guns being imported. It's like all of these things you think it would be intercepted before it got on U.S. soil. So you would assume that there is some governmental cooperation. In Los Angeles, is a specific example. So there was Rick Ross, also known as Freeway Ricky. It is alleged that in the early 80s, Rick Ross was selling $3 million worth of cocaine, which was broken down further into crack a day. So with the war on drugs and the war on poverty, you have all of these issues. Now there's a huge drug problem, both as a means of employment and also, of course, for the drug users, both parties of people are criminalized, so the drug users and the drug dealers are going to prison, and they're going to prison for unbelievable amounts of time considering that they're not violent offenses. So the community is losing people to prison for multiple reasons based on drugs. And then, of course, there's the addiction. The black community is being desolated by addiction and an overdose. And so this leads to a lot of children not having parental guidance, not having their parents either, you know, in the home or even available to them because they're either dead on drugs or in prison. And so then there's the gangs. And the thing is, the gangs, you know, originally gangs came around and they had a positive purpose, which from what I can recall was based on community development and community defense because the Los Angeles Police Department brought in KKK members from the South to police the black communities in, you know, the Los Angeles area because a lot of those communities were flourishing. Los Angeles itself was founded by a black person. So they wanted to disrupt the progress that was going on in the black community. And so they brought in the KKK members to terrorize the black people. And so black people figured that they had to, you know, defend themselves from these terrorists called police officers. But then like Nixon's war on drugs, the government was coming in and getting rid of leaders and infiltrating organizations and, you know, bastardizing anything positive that the black community had. So with gangs, you know, it used to be about family brotherhood or whatever. And then it becomes this thing where it's just, it's kind of like what you do, everyone does it. You have to join a gang to protect yourself. There's a lot of territorialism, but you kind of lose sense of the codes that were used by the creators of the organizations because those people are in prison or those people are dead. So it becomes a lot of violence and drugs and not a lot of protection or defense or anything that is uplifting the community. Another thing to talk about that was around the Reagan era was rap, was hip hop. So hip hop was born in the late 70s, early 80s. If you have Netflix, The Get Down is a a mini series. The first part details you know the origin the birth of hip-hop and so hip-hop was born in new york at that time and it was mostly about bringing to light the living conditions that black people were subjected to you know in the hoods the projects the ghettos and how it wasn't working it wasn't humane it just opened up so many people to all of these horrors and and this struggle that just caused so many negative outcomes. 
one thing that people don't really talk about is that, of course, you would think in a very dense populated area there is very stressful it's a very stressful situation and stress and mental illness can go hand in hand when you're very stressed on a regular basis that can change the structure of your brain people are just fighting to survive they're fighting to live there's not a lot of personal space not a lot of green space not a lot of you know opportunity to just take a breath And then something I've experienced while living in Los Angeles is the noise pollution. I find it very difficult to find a quiet, serene moment to myself because there's always traffic noise. There's always the helicopters. There's always the sirens. And these are just things you hear every hour of the day. And coming from a an area where there was a lot of big open spaces and a lot of quiet restful moments it makes me feel uneasy it makes me feel anxious and a lot of people don't talk about what stress can do to your brain and so there's just all of these things going on and the black people were talking about that and they were using hip-hop as an outlet they were using hip-hop to give a voice to their struggle but then so many people could relate to the music so the genre just took off and it became extremely popular in very little time And of course, capitalism, when white people see something that's working, they come in and try to get the money, get as much money as they can. And because, you know, music is inspirational, it moves our soul, it fortifies us. I assume the execs, the powers that be, figured that while it could do positive things for a community, it could also do negative things for a community I don't think that's actually where gangster rap came from. I think gangster rap came from people living in circumstances and situations that were just kind of unbelievable, unbearable, but with less of the activism. I mean, because to some degree, if you live in a very, very tough situation, when all you really can think about survival and like not being harassed or murdered by the police or falling victim to you know gang violence or drugs or prison, you might not have a lot of time to have these activist thoughts. And then, you know, if the community has been split up and divided in so many ways and the population is relatively new, some of the activists, they haven't established themselves or they've been taken out early. And so it's like the grit of the New York hip hop, but without the level of positive messages, N.W.A. came around in 1986 and they talked about a lot of negative things. And it could be said that they were glorifying it, or it could be said they were just talking about their lives. But what they really didn't have was a critical conversation about why those conditions were unacceptable. And, you know, they came in with the misogyny and the complete disrespect of women, which was, I think, was new. That was out of left field, but people embraced it. And I think that is when, you know, white people stepped in and took rap took hip-hop over and um that's why i feel like you see people be excellent rappers and they have all these great messages but they don't get the attention that other people get well, these record labels they always want to push people who want to talk about drugs and money and like forget this and forget that i don't care about my people all i care about is getting money and then so people hear this and they see people who are able to leave these situations these poor circumstances these horrible circumstances and they're making all of this money and you know when you have so little sometimes money can look like it fixes everything in 1992, Bill Clinton was elected, and even though he ran on rehabilitation, not incarceration, he immediately, once elected, adopted the drug war strategies of his predecessors. One of the things that Clinton did was that he rejected the U.S. Sentencing Commission's recommendation to eliminate the disparity between crack and powder cocaine. So if you say that, you know, he was first black president or whatever, he was for black people, he was definitely not for black people because crack, it had been classified as this black people drug. So when you don't want to get rid of the sentencing disparities because you have the intention of negatively impacting the black community. He also rejected 
the health secretary's advice to end the federal ban on funding for syringe access programs. By the time he was leaving the office, he was like, oh, I should have done things differently and we really need to reevaluate. But that was eight years later after the damage was done. You know, one of the things that he was most known for after the fact, outside of him playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall, was the notorious 1994 crime bill. This bill included an $8.7 billion reserve for prison construction for states that enacted truth and sentencing laws, which require people convicted of violent crimes to serve at least 85% of their sentences. This bill also created the Three Strike Law. The sweeping Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act provided funding for tens of thousands of community police officers and drug courts, banned certain assault weapons, and mandated life sentences for criminals convicted of a violent felony after two or more prior convictions, including drug crimes. The mandated life sentences were known as a three-strike provision. So this led to further mass incarceration, gutted our community of all kinds of people who may have contributed in positive ways. So this left us with parentless homes, no community development. So when you look at the present situation, when people talk about black owned black crime, you have to think about the fact that there still aren't any jobs, that there's no community development, no constructive outlets, drugs, no uplifting music. There's a lack of unity because We're constantly competing for very, very scarce resources so the people who live next to you can easily look like your enemies. And as I said, this is a very segregated country, so the people next to you are the people that look like you. Then, of course, there is the violence, but something they also don't talk about is that some of this is exacerbated by external forces. There's a lack of resources, failing public schools, these guns coming from who knows where. There's the over-policing because, you know, they've painted us as these violent criminals, as these animals, these savages. So that just gives police officers free reign to come into our communities and harass and brutalize and even murder us. Of course, there's mass incarceration and now there's gentrification. So like these communities that used to be public housing projects are now being bought out. But the thing is, while people say that these areas are being revitalized, they're not being revitalized for the black citizens, the black residents. They're being revitalized for white people with way more money. So now black people are being pushed out, but black people don't have anywhere to go. Not even, you know, the projects, not even these high rises with very little space and very little light, nothing like the homeless population, like in Durham, North Carolina, where Duke is expanding out, pushing further and further into the local community, the homeless population is growing significantly. Now there's so much control over our culture. With hip hop, hip hop was a voice of a generation. And then white people went and found people that just wanted to make money and they're willing to do anything and say anything to get that money. And we look at those people as our people. And so we listen to them and we aspire to be these things as well because we kind of feel like our people wouldn't lead us astray. And then we start buying into music that doesn't speak to our soul or it perverts our soul. And then with the advent of social media, they get hip to our trends and our cultural traditions way faster. All of a sudden, you see all these white people with these braids and all of these ridiculous things. And then they have the nerve to tell us that they're not appropriate in our culture, that we don't corner the market on hairstyles and blah, 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 blah. But you know, when we are getting denied from jobs, we corner the market on those hairstyles. They try to tell us that they're not appropriate in our culture because black people in America don't have culture. But if we don't have culture, then why does the entire world emulate us, try to imitate us, and then make it to seem like they created it? So, I mean, that was my talk on black on black crime. You know, if you're going to try and have that conversation, you're going to try and use that term against us. It's impossible to do so without speaking to the circumstances and the situations in which we have been put in the consistent oppression, the deliberate attacks on our community. All of this was set into place. All of this was set into play and It's very difficult to overcome that when you spend so much of your time just trying to make it to the next day. I'm going to end this segment with a song from Rodney Wright called Breaking Down These Trees. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh. Xavier Jordan. You meet me in the air force. Hey, I'm scared east. <laughs> Breaking down these trees, breaking down these trees Man, it's that 93 Supreme, 93 Supreme My pot tell me I need to chill, fucking with that weed I'm sorry, man, it's the only thing that keep my mind at ease The world hate us, but it's cool, cause I don't need a thing Man, I just pray that my Lord keep on guiding me But as a lady, feel like he kinda dodging me I'm trying not to lose faith, the devil trying me, man But for that nigga, life don't stop, we just keep it moving Getting lifted with my niggas, plotting out our movements I'm trying to get up out my city, niggas always shooting They call us monsters, but I have no idea what we go through, man It's fucking crazy, cause my mind is sharper than a tutor But to the outside world, they probably just see us as stupid Because we all said fuck school for a dream pursuit I'm trying to take a load up off my mind, I bet this way to do it Just breaking down these trees Just breaking down these trees Just breaking down these trees Breaking down these trees, breaking down these trees. To breaking down these trees. To breaking down these trees. To breaking down these trees. Breaking down these trees, breaking down these trees. Fingers real sticky from that good shit. Fuck a grinder, break it down with your hands, man. I had to split with my split, cause that's a charge now. But I'm a man, I bust that right down with my paws, yo. Double XL, mag up in my lap. My whole car is starting to smell just like a pack My eyes low, but man, they been doing that I'm trying to get right with God, can you get up on my sack? People in the world wanna see you do bad But when you doing good, they walk around all sad Damn, niggas out here acting just like hoes, lack of dads Genocide of my homies ain't it sad Cause we built this country while they sat up on their ass When you try to run shit, they shoot you in your back Well, I'ma run it anyway and snatch that cash For the ones that have gone spark this L, then we ass, yeah Just breaking down these trees Just breaking down these trees Just breaking down these trees Breaking down these trees Breaking down these trees Just breaking down these trees to breaking down these trees, to breaking down these trees, to breaking down these trees, breaking down these trees. So that was Rodney Wright with Breaking Down These Trees. Please remember to like and share this video and leave a comment in the comment section and also to subscribe to our channel. That was The Black Print and this is MJ sending you love, peace, and ammunition.